colleagues return to their seats. We're gonna take the roll call in 10 seconds. All right, I think we have a quorum. Tony, can we take the roll? Jimenez? Present. Torres? Present. Cohen? Here. Ortiz? Present. Davis? Here. Doan? Present. Candelas? Present. Foley? Here. Batra? Present. Kame? Mayhan? Here. You have a quorum. Great, thank you. Okay, if you're able, please stand and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Great, thank you. Today's invocation will be from Saida Muller, Mulder, a singer, songwriter, and San Jose State alumnus. And Council Member Jimenez will tell us more. And Saida, if you wanna come on up, please do. Go ahead, Council yeah. Member. Yeah, thank you, Mayor, and I apologize for not being there today, but uh, as you can see, Saida's uh, walking up there. You know, every February, we honor Black History Month by celebrating the generations of African Americans who in spite of adversity, have made notable contributions to American society. Black History Month is much more than the recognition of a few historical events and historical figures. It is also about spreading awareness of the collective struggles faced by black communities and recognizing the important achievements of all black Americans while continuing to support black history, traditions, and culture. Black History Month is a time to accurately acknowledge the historical inequities that have oppressed our black communities as well as the current challenges that still hinder the growth and progress of communities of color. Black History Month is also a reminder that we must continually work towards a future free of racism and discrimination. And given that today is the last day of Black History Month, I find it fitting to share with you the talents of Sadie, Seda Mulder. Seda is a singer, songwriter, and SJSU alumni who majored in vocal performance and minored in business. She currently works at San Jose's beloved Plant Lush and is a member of the Bay Worship Collective. She's here today to perform her rendition of the Black National Anthem. So Seda, thank you so much for being here and the floor is yours. And um, I'll be brief for those who haven't had lunch. <laughs> Thank you. Lift every voice and sing till earth and heaven ring. Ring with the harmonies of liberty. Let our rejoicing rise high as the listening skies. Let it resound loud as the rolling sea. song full of the faith that the dark past has taught us sing a song full of the hope that the present has brought us facing the rising Let us march on till victory is won. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Sayda. So, uh, appreciate it. Thank you, Saida, for sharing your immense talent with us. That was beautiful. Thank you, Councilmember Jimenez. We will move on to ceremonial items, and Councilmember Ortiz will join me up front to present a commendation recognizing Selena Rodriguez for her groundbreaking journalism career. Today we're honoring the legendary career of our city's own Selena Rodriguez, an accomplished journalist and champion of the community. Selena began her career as a print and radio reporter in her native Guadalajara, first coming to California as a John S. Knight Journalism Fellow at Stanford University. There was a rule against reporting during the fellowship, but Selena couldn't help herself. She wanted to see firsthand the conditions of Latinos in California. She talked to families working on farms and in cities, covering labor strikes, protests, and the day-to-day -day lives of everyday families. Her reporting on the border even won her a prestigious journalism award back in Mexico. After her fellowship ended, she knew she wanted to return to the Bay Area. That is when she began her long career in television journalism in 1988. The 11 years she spent at Telemundo established her career as an authentic and trusted voice of the community. And when her contract was not renewed, there was protests outside the Telemundo station. She then spent time at Univision and as a national anchor for CNN in Espanol, before returning for one last stint as the lead anchor at Telemundo in 2003. In 2003, she returned her, to her current endeavor, her radio show on La Caliente Noticias y Más con Selena Rodriguez. The program has become a new cornerstone of the community, creating a Spanish language forum on the issues that affect all local communities. It is for your incredible career in journalism and advocacy for your adopted community that we honor you, Selena, with this commendation that the mayor will be presenting shortly. And now I would like to pass the mic to Selena Rodriguez herself to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, what, what can I say? I can say that San Jose is my city. San Jose, its people, the community has become my city, my home. And uh, it's been a very, very long journey, 36 years of doing journalism here in the Bay Area. And the Bay Area is in my heart. When the, I was offered the position in CNN Español to head a newscast for Mexico. More than half of my heart, I left my heart not in San Francisco, I left my heart in San Jose. So when Telemundo offered me the opportunity to come back to San Jose, to my city, I said, of course. And a lot of people, my family said, are you crazy? You're leaving CNN and you're going back? And I said, oh, because my heart is here. The dream of my life was to do what I'm doing now. Being an independent producer, I have a radio program. I also do programs on Facebook, and I do all kinds of projects with different um, institutions and organizations. Has given me the opportunity, hopefully, to serve more to my community. So much to say, San Jose, every, every street that I drive, I've been doing journalism here since 87. Every, almost every city that I drive by, a house, a school, uh, a place, reminds me of a story that we covered. So as an independent producer since 2006, for 16 years, almost 17 years, I hope and I ask God always to give me the the tools to keep serving my community. And when I'm not doing a good job, please let me know very clearly 
because I'm kind of distracted. And he will tell me what the next step is. But for now, I hope that for many, many years I can keep serving my community. And I'd like to thank you, my son. This is a career, a very demanding career. I'd like to thank you also, Lion Nelson, the founder of the John Knight Fellowship, who trusts me and believe in me. And it happens to be his birthday today. So it's a beautiful, beautiful present. So many uh, coincidences and so many things to say about journalism, the power and the passion to serve my community and my city. I offer you my program. I offer you all the productions that I do for the good of our city and the good of our community. Thank you, thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. I'm all yours, always. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias desde el fondo de mi corazón. Soy de ustedes, mi comunidad. Thank you. Now, uh, as the mayor uh, presents the accommodation, I'd like to invite in my colleagues who would like to join for the photo. Okay, thank you, council member. We are on to orders of the day. We have one addition under item 8.2, which requires a two thirds vote to add. This has to do with how we are accepting uh, state funds for a new EIH site at Brandon and Monterey. Are there any other changes to the agenda? Okay, we are I'll, also. Oh, go I was going to say, I'll move though, thank you. adoption of orders. Do you have a second? Second. Great. Thank you. And then uh, we are, before we vote, we're adjourning today's meeting, and why don't we do that now, and then we'll take the vote. Does that work? Sure. Great. Okay. So I'd like to adjourn today's meeting in memory of Charles Chuck Delano Alexander, who passed away on January 2nd of 2023. Chuck was a trailblazer in San Jose and Santa Clara County during the Civil Rights Movement and was one of the founders of the Good Brothers House, a house that allowed student athletes of color to study, sleep, and socialize during a time when segregation was still legal. Chuck was also a self-taught photographer who documented the civil rights movement in San Jose and, the, and across the South Bay through his photographs. These photographs are currently on display in the MLK Library right across the street on the fifth floor in the Africana, Asian American, Chicano, and Native American Studies Center. At this time, I'd like to welcome his son, a trailblazer in his own right, a community leader, school board member of the, of the Alum Rock School District, where I used to teach, 
and a former president of the San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP, Tony Alexander, to say a few words about his father. Hi, Tony. Come on down. Great to have you here. Uh, Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Council Members. Uh, it is an honor to go ahead and actually stand up here and speak on behalf of my father, who was a trailblazer, yes, uh, and uh, just uh, say thank you for adjourning the meeting. Um, I'm going to do a, a little quick shout out. I'm going to tell Council Member Foley, you know, he moved to your, your area. He used to live in Cambrian. And so uh, we were over there on Foxworthy and Lee for, for many years. And so uh, he ended up um, going over to the east side. Uh, and living in East San Jose for uh, the rest of his life. But one of the things I do just want to mention is that um, he came here in 55 uh, with his suitcase coming from L.A., and he landed over there at San Pedro uh, Street at the Greyhound bus station, walked it up to San Jose State, and said, Coach, I'm here, and I'm ready to play football. So he was a Spartan. Uh, he was a good brother, as you had mentioned, and he had done a number of great things. And one of the things that he really enjoyed was being here a part of the city of San Jose. Um, the leaders, uh, he supported Janet Gray Hayes, Iola Williams, Susan Hammer. Those were some of the leaders that he came out and supported and worked with, and also attending Antioch Baptist Church. So again, thank you for this opportunity. And one of the great things too is that he had an opportunity to see his grandchildren graduate from college. Uh, first when Brandon at Alcorn State, second when Florida A&M, uh, Marika, uh, third um, Jordan at Alabama State, and then um, he didn't get a chance to see his his other granddaughter walk, um, but she graduated this December, Ashley, from uh, Cal State Dominguez, and so that was one of his prides and joys in being able to see his grandchildren come out, participate, and uh, be a part of this wonderful city. And so again, Spartan, San Jose, forever. And again, thank you very much. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Tony. Thank you so much. Oh, I got to do one quick thing. I'm going to ask if uh, we stay. I'm going to turn around and do a quick selfie. Let's do a selfie. All right. I can see everyone up here. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Okay, Tony, do we have any public comment since we are, uh, there is a motion to change the orders of the day? No, there are no hands. Okay, then let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Yes. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, go on to the closed session report. Laura, do we have any report out of closed session today? Thank you, Mayor. We do not. Okay. Thank you. Next is the consent calendar. I believe we are pulling an item or two. Do uh, any of my colleagues want to pull items from the consent calendar? Councilor Dwan. Thank you, Mayor. I would like to pull the item number 2.23 and ask for an independent discussion and vote on this item. Okay. I believe that and the taxpayer protection hey, and the government. I'm sorry, Council Member. Let's let me just get, uh, understand which items are being pulled, and then uh, Councilor Torres, I believe, as well as pulling an item. Is that correct? Yes, just uh, pulling 2.7 for comment. Okay. Are there any other items that the council wishes to pull? Okay. Great. Uh, why don't we go in order, Councilor Torres? Do you uh, want to speak on 27? And, and are you asking for a separate vote on 2-7? I know Council Member Dewan is on his. No. No, okay. So go ahead and comment on 2-7. Yeah, no, just uh, definitely just want to comment on, on 2.7. So thank you, Mayor, for allowing me to do that. Uh, I just wanted to pull this item because I wholeheartedly believe that this is a very important issue that our city should be involved in. It's, it's DACA. Uh, so we all know that we have a broken immigration system here in the United States and that our city is nearly 40% uh, foreign born, and that DREAMers, or DACA recipients, are as, as American as, as, as anyone else. Uh, they purchase homes, they invest in small businesses, 
There are the teachers who educate our children. There are our doctors, our nurses who care for our sick and our elderly. They are real people with real families and have made contributions not only here in our city of San Jose, but throughout our nation. So uh, we all know that in the next 10 years, San Jose is gonna look very, very different. Uh, and we need to make sure that the voice of our immigrant community uh, is empowered and is able to affect change. And so I love that we are gonna be part of this process. So. Great, thank you, as do I. Couldn't agree more. Uh, do we have other comments on, specifically on item 2.7? Councilor Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor, and I wanna thank our city attorney for bringing this forward. Um, and although they'll prob probably never hear this, I wanna thank the county and city of Los Angeles and their administration for filing this brief on behalf of uh, supporting counties. I firmly believe that DACA recipients deserve protections and ultimately a pathway to citizenship. As the representative for East San Jose, a district that many undocumented immigrants, especially dreamers and farm workers call home, I carry a particular interest in fixing the broken immigration uh, system. Immigrants have uh, sig significantly contributed to this country and to the city of San Jose um, and the foundation of our city is built uh, in many ways off their labor. Um, so it's time we stop vilifying them and give the rights and liberties that they've earned. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Appreciate your comments as well. Okay, that item will be voted on with the rest of the consent calendar. We will also, should we vote on the entire calendar except for the one that's been pulled at this time? Can I have yes. a motion to that effect? Uh, Move uh, for, Second. yeah, so we're exactly. Yeah, and we're specifically <laughs> pulling out. So just to be clear, for those who are watching along here, we are at uh, Councilor Dwan's request pulling out the California Ballot Initiative to increase voter threshold. I don't actually have the number here in my notes. I apologize. 2.23. 2.3. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Great. And we have a motion, a second to vote. Do we have public comment on the consent calendar? Elizabeth Briarly. Yes, hello, this is Elizabeth Briarly. Pardon me, um, is now the time to speak on that uh, ballot measure or we wait until it? That'll be the next of... item. We're currently voting on the rest of the consent calendar. Very good, thank you. Thank you. Okay, there's no other hands. Okay, let's vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kamei? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Great. So that passes unanimously. Councilor Dawn, the floor is yours on item 2.23. Thank you, Mayor. I believe the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act should be brought before the Council for transparency purposes, specifically because many in the public are not aware of it. And we, as a governing body, should be willing to adhere to the statewide standard or better for new taxes and want to be more accountable in full sunshine according to the taxpayer of San Jose. The Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act does nothing more than close tax loopholes at the local level and align municipality to be held to the highest standard on issue, which are resident tax money for public purpose. And make it easier for resident to understand how new tax will impact them financially, what will they get from it, and how long it will last. California has the largest tax burden of any state, which contribute to the high, to the sky high cost of living we all experience here. The Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Acts give voters the right to vote on all state and local taxes and is required two-third majority to approve any new or increased special taxes proposed during a local election. New state taxes require two-third votes. We should, we should not, so should not, we want the same standard for local taxes. If a measure is good and is needed, then the voter will vote for it overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly numbers 
as we have seen in previous election, a vote of 50% plus one means that almost 50% of the population oppose the law of change. People want transparency. People want to know what they are voting on. Core services will most likely not be impacted. And if they are, perhaps, perhaps we need to do a better job of governing and budgeting from the day is. I believe in my colleagues up here, both established and new, and I motion for San Jose to support the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. Is there a second? Okay. Councilor Cohn. Yeah, thank you. Um, this act is probably one of the most egregious ballot measures that's come, coming before the voters in decades. Um, in fact, it's so scary that the League of California Cities is putting every resource they have into defeating it. And I've never, you know, in my years, a couple years of, as a member of the board there, haven't seen them so scared of a ballot initiative. And this goes across the state. There wasn't a single member of any city, regardless of the city's political leanings, um, anywhere in the state that supports this initiative. And, and in the principles of local control, this is really important for us to oppose. Um, in fact, it's so bad that it actually is written to retroactively cancel ballot measures that, that have passed previously, which is really scary to many cities, local districts, jurisdictions across the state. It's why the, there's a huge coalition um, against this. Um, SEIU, Teachers Association, Professional Firefighters, the Federation of Teachers, the School Employees Association, um, Labor Federation, also the, the local, the Federation of State County Municipal Employees, they're joining with the League of Cities and many of the other uh, statewide associations in putting a lot of resources into making sure this, this measure doesn't pass. A year ago, more than a year ago, when we got word that this was coming uh, forward and they, th they threatened to put it on the ballot in 2022, um, I brought forward the initiative that the Rules Committee in, uh, un, of this city and on, uh, unanimously passed to put, send a resolution to the state and in support of the League of Cities opposition to this measure. Um, and it's important that we reaffirm that now that it's actually qualified for the 2024 ballot and that we're all um, on board with making sure that this does not pass. Um, this is not a measure that was grassroots generated. Um, this measure was paid for by basically two industries in the state of California. It was paid for by the oil and gas industry and was paid for by the large banks, corporate banks. It's basically only to help increase revenue and reduce taxation of these largest businesses in the state of California. It wasn't even clear to me who this California Business Roundtable is. This isn't somebody who is representing small businesses or even middle-sized businesses. This is oil and gas and banking companies trying to game the system. Um, so I urge us to uh, get on the record with every other city in the state that's doing so and, and oppose this measure. I'll make a motion to, uh, for the staff recommendation. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. I don't see another hands. I, I will say I certainly don't think this is the time for tax increases, and I appreciate Councilmember Dewan's uh, interest in fiscal responsibility. It's to be lauded, and I've always thought it was strange that we have a higher threshold of two-thirds for specific um, restricted measures and, and the lower threshold for general taxes. But uh, as Councilmember Cohen said, I, I don't think that um, this ballot measure addresses either of those issues and in fact uh, poses a, a risk to local government as, as he outlined. So uh, I'll be supporting the motion. I don't see any other hands up, so let's vote. We have public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank Jeff you, public comment. Jeffrey Buchanan. And followed by Elizabeth. Uh, Jeffrey Buchanan, Working Partnerships USA. Uh, thankfully, Councilmember Cohen, I think, took most of the things I was going to point out. And so, uh, you know, certainly appreciate Mayor Mayhan and others on council who voiced uh, opposition to this measure. It's a, it's a gross overreach uh, by a handful of corporate special interests and, you know, could really harm the ability of 
our city in the future, our county, other entities to be able to tackle all the big priorities that we know we have. Um, you know, in particular, uh, it will harm the initiative process, which is so sacred here in California, and even things like looking at impact fees in the future, pushing those to be a ballot measure instead of just the decision of this council. Um, and so uh, appreciate, hopefully, that this council will stand with other cities and the huge coalition that is opposing this measure. Uh, it's going to take uh, a lot of different uh, actors coming together to make sure that this doesn't constrain our city and our ability to tackle our biggest problems. Thank you so much. Elizabeth? Yes, thank you. I am here, this is Elizabeth Fryerly. I'm a longtime San Jose resident, homeowner, and past president and current board member of Silicon Valley Taxpayers Association, website svtaxpayers.org. We have endorsed this Taxpayer Protection Act and adopted a resolution which we provided the clerk via email. We urge you, our representatives in this government by the people, to adopt the resolution that we provided in favor of the Taxpayer Protection and Government Accountability Act. It's important, as Mayor Mahan enthusiastically campaigned last fall, we need to get down to basics. When I hear two council members mentioning the 98 core services that we have as a city, that is too many. <laughs> we need to, I can think of three, police, fire, and roads. 98 core services is too many. In 2006 and 2008, San Jose Structural Budget Deficit Elimination Task Force, we would have agreed on that. We need to get back to basics and we need transparency. This measure would empower voters and taxpayers, not weaken them. That is doublespeak if you think that this will weaken or disempower taxpayers and voters. Please adopt our resolution to support this important measure and don't be seen as as opposing your very employers, the taxpayers. Thank you. Back to the council. Thank you. Seeing no further hands, I think we're ready to vote. Jimenez? Torres? This is a motion by Councilor Cohen to um, Approve uh, staff recommendation. Yes, approve staff recommendation. Just clarify. Yes. <laughs> Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? No. Candelas? Aye. Bully? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Going back to Jimenez? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We are on to 3.1, report of the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I have no report today. Okay, thank you. 3.2, we have a labor update. We're on to 3.3, Board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices interview. And Tony, I understand we do not have we, we do not have all, all the applicants, is that right? Right, we, we had six applicants. Um, three originally responded, a fourth did respond um, at the beginning of this meeting. So we have four people to, to interview today. Um, the, three the four applicants present today are Christopher Lee, Baltazar Lopez, Ravi Patak, and Jennifer T Tunis. Um, we will ask those in person to sit in the box, if you guys could, I already described this to them. Um, Great, so if we could have all four we're gonna candidates do, come we're gonna down do it and the sit in the did. box together. Yes, yeah, so two are on Zoom. Oh, I see. And so I'm gonna ask okay. them to turn on their cameras right now. Um, we're going to go through like we did with the District 10, where you can ask each applicant one question. You're not required to ask them a question, and they'll have two minutes to respond to those questions. Um, at the end of the interview, you may appoint up to three people today. It requires a two-thirds vote per person, so we need at least eight to appoint a person. If a vacancy remains, um, we will return on March 28th with additional applicants. We did receive three additional applications after the deadline. Um, so we can invite those additional three to interview on March 28th if there are remaining vacancies. Um, and I'm going to ask the first question, and they'll each have two minutes to respond. We're going to start with Christopher. Um, please take two minutes to tell us about your background as it relates to this commission and include how you are familiar with campaign laws. Can you hear me? Yes. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Christopher Lee. Um, I was a product manager at Ernst & Young working for our technology consulting service line, and uh, it's an audit firm. So that's the extent of my experience as it relates. Okay, um, Baltazar. Hi, thank you for having me again. It's been a couple of months since you last interviewed me, but I'm currently on the board of Fair Campaign and Political Practices, as you may know. And some of the at night, uh, I currently work for Congresswoman Anna Eshu, and I have a master's degree in philosophy with a focus in technoethics or ethics as a whole. Okay, Ravi. Uh, Mr. Mayor, uh, uh, sorry, Council Members on this side, that sounded really muffled for us. So, Baltazar, could we have you try again? I don't know if they have to turn off the volume or. Sure. Can you hear me now? Is it clear? Yes, I believe so. Go ahead. Yeah. So, I'm a current uh, board member of the Fair Campaign and Political Practices Committee. And for those that have uh, seen me before, you've uh, done this, this process with me a couple of months ago. For those that haven't, I currently work with the Congresswoman Anna Eshu, and I also have a master's degree in philosophy the focus in ethics and technoethics. Okay, Ravi. Hi, Mayor. Vice Mayor, City Manager, City Attorney, and Council Members. Uh, my name is Ravi Pathak. Um, born in a very happy family with uh, four sisters, myself in the middle, two elder, two younger, and uh, grew up with a family, have fam happy family, now also married, and have a son who is going to the college, going to be third year, um, I'm currently working with Oracle as a senior uh, director, um, managing uh, the SAS, Oracle Fusion SAS. And um, I have a PhD and two masters, and I'm a student for, the, for my life. I keep uh, getting involved into some education uh, all the time. Um, from the point of volunteering, I volunteer for several nonprofit organizations like Art of Living, a Rotary Club, and I chartered a Rotary Club as a president. And uh, we do a lot of activities, not only locally but globally. Um, I'm also in, I was involved um, in several initiatives uh, from several leaders from the city of San Jose and also Cupertino um, and Sunnyvale. I, I, Myself have not initiated any campaign, but have involved in these campaigns uh, to support for a good cause, which will impact the community. And I like to make a difference in the community. That's something that I like to give back. And um, uh, even in the Rotary Club, we, during the pandemic, I was very well actively involved in uh, helping the community in several uh, areas. Um, not to mention names, but yeah with uh, several leaders of the city. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Yes, good afternoon. <clears throat> Excuse me, Mr. Mayor and Council. I apologize for my video not being available this afternoon. Wanted to introduce myself though. My name is Jennifer Tonis. I am a 20 plus year resident of uh, the city of San Jose. I currently live in the downtown area. Um, I have had the pleasure of serving as a local government management consultant to many cities across California and in fact the West, and one of them being the city of, of San Jose beginning in uh, 2009 and most recently in the summer of, of 2020. And in that, in that space, I've also been able to volunteer and work on several uh, uh, political campaigns for the city. And with that firsthand knowledge of seeing the political process, not only on the administrative level, but then also during elections, I, I feel that uh, that this commission is particularly important to helping us rebuild trust in our election process, um, but also in the day to day transparency of our government. Um, so I look forward to an opportunity of taking my experience as a management consultant. I also hold a master's in public administration uh, and to bring that forward and to serve our community and serve our city. Thank you. Okay, so now it's your guys' turn, and I can, I'll can call the names in order once you ask your questions. So I'll track who's answering first. Understood. Thanks, Tony. Great. Do we have any hands up? Colleagues, any questions of our candidates? Councilor Foley. 
Actually, I have a question of Tony. Mm -hmm. Tony, sure. there are a few other applicants that we've received, but they're not here. Can you tell me why? Uh, two of them could not make it today. Um, so if we were to not fill all three, three seats, those two will get invited to the March 28th meeting. Okay, so those that's Lee Space yes. and Tonya Robertson? Yes. Okay. And did they happen to indicate why they could not be here today? Just conflicts. Okay. Thank you. They hope happen to be both D9 residents, so oh. <laughs> curious to meet them. Thank you. Okay, I'll jump in, not seeing any other hands. My question is, uh, you know, we all have political leanings and preferences, but this is a body that requires absolute independence and a focus on, on fairness and, and uh, applying the rules in a consistent manner. What will you do to ensure that your political leanings don't influence your decision making on this body? Okay, we're gonna start with Baltazar. Uh, thank you for that question. I think I've been able to prove that as I've served in this capacity for the last about six months, there has been two cases where uh, there were some kind of ties presented in the case to people that I knew. While I could have still made a decision on that case after speaking with counsel, the parents did not feel right at the public and myself. So I, I recused myself from both overall not attending the meeting so that there wouldn't be my presence at all. So I think I've shown that I'm able to commit to the ethical decisions, even when I have the counsel saying that I can, it's appearance that matters just as much as the legality of things. And I think that's the extent of my answer, but I can go into further details and other examples that I've done. Okay, Ravi. Yeah, thank you. I have, um, I like indicated, I have uh, my whole initiatives have been to make a difference in the community and immaterial to which political leader or a a campaign, uh, if it is impacting and making a difference in the, to the society and uh, uh, the community, then I like to be participating into it. And also being a Rotarian for 13, 14 years, we have a very a good test that we, we say a four-way test. And the four-way test is, uh, the first one is, is it the truth? And then, is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendship? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? And I believe in it and I practice it in my day-to-day -day life. Thank you. Jennifer? Thank you for the question, uh, Mr. Mayor. I, I think it is very important. The a hallmark of this kind of, this, or, this commission certainly is bringing transparency and ethics regardless of where a person's stance comes from. And I think my role with the League of Women Voters is, is evidence to my ability to take a step back away from partisan politics. Um, I have been uh, active with them for quite some time, as well as, as my service in, as a local government consultant. There are no politics in that world. Uh, we work to help uh, governments work a little bit better, and it's not an issue of, of um, partisanship. And again, as, as was said previously, if there is an instance that comes up, given my past experience with local elections where there is a conflict, I'm more than happy to, to take a step back um, and it would insist on doing it. As, as I said before, it's a, um, I would like the opportunity to rebuild trust in election processes uh, and taking that step back would, would be key in achieving that goal. Thank you. Okay, Christopher. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, for the question. Um, the, all of the various different communities that I've been involved in where I've volunteered, I have served in nonprofits that are nonpartisan. And at the audit firm that I worked at previously, we're required to declare all of our financials. And um, if I were appointed to this position, I would um, serve impartially and neutrally in all of the investigations that I'm involved in. Thanks. Great, thank you. And we'll continue rotating through the answers. I now see a number of hands up. So we'll go to Councilmember Batra. Uh, 
Thank you for appearing here with this interest. Uh, please describe any experience or any interaction you either had with FPPC or with FEC in connections with the elections. Okay, Ravi. Uh, abbreviations, could you expand them? FPPC is the California Fair Political and Practices, um, and FEC is the Federal uh, Election Commission. No, uh, I had not, I have not had an opportunity to do that. However, I have to educate myself in the election process. I myself volunteered in several of the booths so to understand how the election process goes through and get educated. Thank you. Okay, Jennifer. Thank you for the question, uh, council member. No, I've not had any direct um, experience or, or interactions with either of those organizations. Christopher. I don't have any direct experience as well. Baltazar. Prior to joining this board, I had it in, in the ability of whenever I was running for office and so on and so forth, but I've had the privilege to be able to run through a lot of cases and investigations on this board in different capacities, and I can go into the details of that, but despite the fact that I've done, the, done this for a couple of months, it's, it's a lot, so I don't blame the other candidates for not interacting. It's a lot of rules, a lot of regulations, a lot of responsibility. Fortunately, we have great staff that's been able to explain everything to me, and even then, I feel that I need a lot more time to catch up and to be the best possible candidate that I, and board member that I possibly keep, uh, be. Okay, thank you. Great, thank you. Councilor Torres. Great, thank you all for applying for this very important position. Which aspect of San Jose campaign laws and ordinances do you need, do you think need more attention and greater commitment from the commission and the council. Jennifer. Thank you, council member Torres uh, for that great question. Uh, you know, when I filled out the application for this position, it was it, a similar question was asked of us. Uh, and that was, what do you, what would you like to see maybe um, shift emphasis for, for the commission? And one of the things, again, reflecting on, on my experience in political campaigns is the speed at which the commission can respond during an election cycle. We know that things move very quickly, and uh, I would like to explore ways where the commission could have a faster timetable, either um, a working timetable or a meeting timetable, in order to meet those very time sensitive um, uh, manners that happen. You can't catch uh, every mailing, you can't catch every um, every question, but I think uh, certainly the commission needs to be working in a different time schedule when we're in season for elections. Christopher? I would be interested in exploring ways um, that um, where conflicts of interest or different special interest groups um, uh, are in, in conflict with uh, campaign finance law. That's that's the area where I would be interested in exploring. Baltazar? One of the big issues that we came across the first time I came around was office holder definitions, elected officials definitions and so forth, and how they use committees to hold on to money for numerous other reasons and the XYZ and transferring that to other committees and so forth. I mean, as we all have seen, Citizen United made a mess of dark money. And I think this committee has an opportunity to flush all of that out, despite the very limited capacity we have because of federal laws. But nevertheless, there are a lot of transparency regulations we can do and a lot of exposure of where this money is coming from, who is it really helping. I think that is the biggest thing this committee should be doing, as, a, as well as creating public trust by clearly outlining what we're responsible for. I think there's some misconception of what we can and can't do. And it, and that can prevent people from using this as a political tool. I think some of my political background has allowed me to see how people use this committee in a very negative way. And, and I frankly disgusted by that. And I've made sure that I vote correctly, neutrally on both sides, because ultimately what I want is an amazing city to live in. 
I think San Jose is the best city for a family to be raised in. And I one day wish to bring my family into the city. And I want to be able to show my, my kids what we've done so that they can be involved in the political process, just like my parents did for me. Ravi? Uh, I would like to, you know, be take the opportunity. Since I, I working in um, Oracle, I, I'm also good in building team and also the processes, improving processes and systems in place, including automation. So I would like to see the gaps where transparency is not there and build processes to make sure that that information is available uh, for various purposes um, that will help in uh, making decisions much quicker. And that will be my area of expertise. Great, thank you all for your answers to that question. We'll move on to Vice Mayor Kamei. Thank you, and uh, I think uh, Council Member Batra uh, sort of uh, we're channeling each other on the FPPC and the FEC. Um, I'd like to hear a little bit more uh, about what you think, like why or why not is the FPPC and the FEC important? Tony, who starts this oh, round? Oh, sorry, um, Christopher. Um, I, I I honestly don't have enough knowledge to be able to comment on on that. Um, Who's next? Um, Baltazar. They set the rules and standard for us to follow. And despite those rules and standards being set, I think that our city of San Jose can do more. But nevertheless, it's a bare standard for us candidates, office holders, and so forth to follow and make sure that they're following the law, the ethics, and the public interest is being met in a financial uh, responsible way. Ravi? Um, I don't know much about them, but uh, any, any governing body is important in a system because uh, being a uh, management representative in ISO 9000, um, if there was a process, if, if there is some uh, process in place which is not documented uh, and not followed, then it's important to audit it and make sure that it gets into the system more you know, as a process and it's put in black and white so that it's clear. So that's important. So if a governing body is there, definitely there should be some importance of why they are there. I don't know much about the governing body or what they do and what they are put in place for, but I'll get educated in time. Thank you. Jennifer? Yes, thank you for the question, Vice Mayor. Uh, it, and it does harkens back to the question that the mayor asked at the beginning about how to be bipartisan. I mean, these these different organizations set rules and standards and they benchmark for the commission of what is acceptable and not acceptable. And the city can choose to move forward from there. But that's our that is our baseline. And it is an independent um, uh, set of rules um, and ethical guidelines by which uh, we follow. And so I, I believe it, 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 it furthers um, the, the removal of a partisanship nature in this commission. Okay. Thank you. Council Member Ortiz. A very straightforward question. Thank you to all the applicants. Um, if there were one piece of campaign um, law that you would change, create or delete, uh, what would it be and why? Baltazar? Now, okay, now you're just letting me uh, uh, let my, my dreams and fantasies go wild. Uh, ideally, I would want to turn over Sins United and without getting into too much detail because I'm not a lawyer and what I've learned from this committee is you don't necessarily provide legal terms, you provide recommendations as what ideally you would want to happen. I would want money out of politics to the extent that it makes it as fair and equal as we as we can and without stripping the voice of the people at the same time because we live in a capitalist society that's just the way things function but there is a limit and extent to, to where our city especially san jose is starting to feel how much money is starting to have an influence on our elections despite what the people are saying money is being pumped in so to me it would have to deal with some kind of adjusting that in a scope that doesn't overstep our freedom of speech, but also realizing that it's, it is getting a little out of hand. And that may not give you an exact answer, but I think it does uh, answer where my state of mind is in terms of what I'd like to do. 
Ravi? I don't have any recommendation as yet, but uh, given an opportunity to review and, and uh, read more about it, I might in future, but not at now, right now. Jennifer? Uh, thank you for the question. I think it, my take again, uh, and I think I might have a different perspective of if I'm able to serve on this commission after a while, but coming from the outside is, as was previously said, the Citizens United uh, decision had a large impact and, and how I fear that that influences in, in San Jose is a lack of transparency of major donors uh, for different um, for different ballot measures and for different candidates. And so I'd wish to see greater transparency um, and ease of transparency so that um, a, a people who are going through their ballot uh, can easily get information from um, the city clerk or the, the county uh, registrar of voters about uh, who is donated to those campaigns. Thank you. Christopher? I'd like to echo the earlier comments about transparency as well as uh, being able to get money out of politics. Okay. Great. Thank you all. Councilor Dwan. Thank you for coming to the interview. What is your idea for following up on political complaints, which cost the taxpayer tens of thousands of dollars in research expenses, especially it's paid to the third party law firms that end up in being baseless? Ravi? <laughs> That's a, a very important uh, issue. Um, Definitely, it needs audit uh, to make sure where the monies come from and for what, and uh, how it's going to be used, and is it something that is being approved, um, or you know, uh, what is the who are the ones to be benef beneficiary out of this? Uh, all this matters uh, in looking into it. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you for the question. I, I, there's definitely complexity in that that I, I hope I would better understood if I have the pleasure of serving the commission in terms of workflow and how ethics investigations are initially seen by commissioners. But what I fundamentally hear is that if a complaint or what I feel is that if a complaint is made, it, it deserves an investigation. I don't know at what level um, because I don't know the, the, the details of it, but fundamentally I believe in transparency in, in governance, and if a, a complaint has been filed, then it needs to be looked into. Thank you. Christopher? Um, I agree that complaints should be properly investigated. Um, perhaps if there is a pattern of a particular individual where there's frivolous uh, complaints constantly being filed. Um, a ju judge can as then assess um, whether there's excessive frivolous complaints and then take appropriate legal action. Baltazar? I've always worked on a budget since I was a kid and my dad always taught me the, the value of, of money, especially when you don't have much of it. So I was actually thrilled to see the opportunity for us to tackle this very issue in the, in the last special meeting where Maybe there's a way to cut costs from a third party by seeing something that isn't in our purview, that isn't in our jurisdiction, and just flat out explaining why it's not something we should do it saves us thousands of dollars that way. Also, we, we received a complaint not too long ago where the failure for, for them to act was a technical to IT issue that doesn't deserve, in my opinion, a full investigation costing me, you, and everybody else hours and thousands of dollars of taxpayers. So I, I strongly believe that there are some really simple, logical cases where we can just cut back, save everyone time. And that gives us time to focus on the real issues, the real matters, and the limited resources the city is facing. Thank you. Great, thank you all for your very thoughtful answers to all those tough questions. Thanks to my colleagues for the questions. I don't see any other hands, so I think we're ready to vote. And Tony, do you want to remind us of how the process will work? Yeah, I'm gonna hand out a ballot that has all four names on it. You can mark up to three, you're not required to mark all three. You can mark one, two, or three people. 
Um, we need eight to vote, so after you mark the ballots, I'm going to tally them. I'll put the score up on the board. You'll double check it to make sure I transcribed your vote correctly. Um, and then we'll go from there. If um, somebody's appointed, somebody's appointed. If um, otherwise, we can, you guys can then direct us to come back on March 28th um, if you want to interview the next group of people. And then on the 28th, you could consider people from today as well. Great. Ne the next month's 28th. Thank you. Hey, Mayor, this is Sergio. Can I, can I ask a question for Tony? Can, you, can, you, can I just text you the names? <laughs> Why don't you email me? That way, or email you? A, okay. that way I have a PRAable uh, Very document. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Council Member. If you guys want to take a few minutes break to go to the bathroom, go ahead. Okay, we have one um, one member with over eight votes, and I don't know why it's not going up on the screen. Oh, it just did. Let me do it again. So, I have is my Zoom quit. <laughs> Hold on, just a second. It's all it's it's coming back up. I have Baltazar Lopez with nine votes. Christopher Lee with three, Ravi P Patak with six, and Jennifer Tunnis with seven. So we have one person who was appointed in the first round of voting. So we can do a second round of voting today or we can hold off until March 28th. And if we hold off on the 28th, can you just remind us, we have some folks who were not able to join today. Yeah, two applicants who are unable to join today plus an additional three. Plus an additional three, okay. Yes. So I guess the council, I'd be open to motions on this and council deliberation. Do we want to, we've appointed one now per the process. We can do another round of voting or we can also include more candidates in the process and continue with an additional vote on, on what date? March 28th. On March 28th. That would give us enough time because we have to do conflict of interest checks. Can, right. I, can I just see the list of the voting totals again? Yeah, I didn't yeah. see them. Before. Sorry. My, my Zoom is doing this like weird thing right now. It... And what does it take to, to get a point eight. of eight. Oh, it takes eight. eight or more. I would almost recommend one more round. We have a couple of people who, you know, came close and maybe now that we Second. Okay. 
So we have a motion and a second to do another round of voting. Okay, I'm gonna use the same sheets as before, well, but, let's, but don't vote for Baltazar. Let's, okay, and let's vote on whether or not that's how we wanna proceed. Okay. So all those in favor, uh, well, sorry, Tony, why don't you take the vote? Yes. On This is to do an additional round of voting. Right, so um, the motion, uh, do I have a motion to make and a yes. second? You do. Do I have a second on it, though? Second. Yeah, Councilmember okay. Torres. Okay, thank you. Um, Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Batra? Yes. Kamei? Mayhan? Uh, aye. Okay, so we'll do one additional round of voting, and again, we'll be we'll be voting on up to two of three. Is that correct? Yes. And it can, you do not have to vote, you and right. you don't have to vote for anyone. You may vote for up to two out of three. Baltazar has already been appointed. Yes. And if we do not, if no one crosses the threshold, we will entertain additional candidates and come back in March. Yes. Yes. Great. So I, I, to save you guys time, I'm using the same vote sheet as before. It'll, it says select up to three, but select up to two and don't vote for Baltazar. He's already appointed. And you can leave blank if you would and like. Yes, you don't have to vote. But please remember to write your name at the top. I want to take this moment and thank you all for your vote and, and trust and confidence. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Baltazar, and we'll let you go. Appreciate your service and congratulations on being reappointed. Thank you. Um, nobody received eight votes. Just give me a second and I'll share the screen. We'll be back in March. I said six, but I meant eight. Um, so we have two, uh, just to read it out loud for those people who can't see the screen at home, Christopher Lee has two, Ravi Patak has six, and Jennifer Tunis has seven. So we will see you back on March 28th. Great. Thank you, Tony. Thanks to all the applicants. Appreciate your time. Okay, we are on to item 3.4, which is the report on bids and award of contract for Tully Road safety improvements. Do we have a staff report? 
No presentation. Okay. Great. Let's go to public comment. No hands are up. Nothing for that one. And no, no cards in person. Okay, back to the council. Let's see who we have. Councilor Torres. Oh, was that from the previous item? And Councilor Candelas. Thank you, Mayor. Just a, quick, a couple quick comments. This is this is a project in my district, um, and and you know I, I just want to iterate the importance of you know the Vision Zero improvements that are going to happen because of this. We we talked about it a lot earlier, and and I just wanted to give a shout out to our to our staff for for. For delivery on this and working collaboratively to identify other funds, state funds, not just local funds, in this project. So, um, so, so with that, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd move recommendation on on uh, the staff report A and B for this. Great, thank you. And I thought I saw Councilor Dewan. Did you have anything you wanted to add? I had several questions, but uh, apparently, do, is there staff uh, available to answer these questions or? No. Yes, we've got staff. Okay, come on up, Good. John. Great. Well, I've watched John or other staff from yeah. DOT if they can come up and Councilmember once he's to go ahead and start asking your question. Thank you, Mayor. There were two deaths which occur on this uh, stretch over the last five years or so, which occur between the low light situation. Why aren't we adding? Any more light poles or improve the low lighting visibility? It, it, you're, I'm sorry, John Russo, Director of Transportation. Is the question why the project's not adding lighting? Yes. Yeah, I think what we're trying to do there is actually more on the geometric configuration of the roadway and at the intersections, trying to make those safer and more visible for pedestrians. Uh, lighting, it does have lighting on it, so it's meeting our standard lighting for in terms of the, uh, the distance between lights and the types of standards that we have out there. We just did the whole city upgrade of to LED light emitting diode, which brightens up all those lights. So we didn't think that lighting was the issue out there. It really was the treatment at the intersections where pedestrians are, are using. So that's, this is a very long corridor, so the all the treatments that we're doing along the whole entire length of it is, is the project. Thank you. The second question I have for you is, there's two major intersections that be, will be converted to eliminate right-hand turn, am I correct? I, I would have to go back and take a look if it's two or more than that, but it could be that, it's, that we're taking out um, or removing the, the, um, the Pork chop islands that are called in terms of some of those are, are more of a free right turn which are pretty dangerous or that we would rather not see those in a pedestrian area like Long Tully. So it could be, I don't know if it's two or if it's more than that that we're doing. Well, but my yes. understanding is that deaths uh, occur on this stretch we're not at the intersection, right? Yeah, I don't know exactly where the fatalities occurred, but sometimes the fatalities are occurring between the intersection where people are not using the crosswalk. And I believe one of them, I think one of them was like that. I don't remember with the other incident, though. Will this increase the chance of vehicle accidents? We don't believe so. This really allows, still allows the same, same amount of lanes. It's still keeping predominantly the same amount of lanes throughout that area. It's just we're, we're making changes at those conflict points where the intersections are. So we spend a lot of money on infrastructure changes, which may or may not save lives. But what is needed is, I be believe it's called behavior modification. Um, much like um, the radar signs or the um, speed cameras or red light cameras uh, that I think years ago we, we, we had that same system that give people autom automatic tickets which changes their behavior. And that would, I think that would save us a lot of money and help reduce the speeding and save lives as well. Have we taken a look into that? 
Yeah, so we do use um, speed indicators where it, it can tell a motorist how fast they're going in over or under the speed limit. So those are employed or deployed in a number of locations throughout the city, and I think we're going to be putting some on, on this project. We don't have uh, authority, state authority, to actually use um, cameras for speeding enforcement at this stage. We've tried for about three years with the legislature, and I believe we're going to be trying again this year to get that authority. A number of cities are interested in doing that. The city of San Jose has been leading that effort. Um, Assemblymember Friedman is, I think she's going to carry another bill. It is something that would be, we would like to see that so that we could actually, it would provide more enforcement along a corridor such as this that wouldn't require officers to be out there all the time. So um, it is something that we have investigated in the past, just haven't been able to get it to the legislature. Hopefully this year it will go. Have you looked into the red light cameras uh, similar to Fremont? And, right. and I, I'm telling you, when I drive through Fremont, I know there's camera. As soon as you cross that line, if it's red, you're going to get a ticket. Right. And so, so it changes my behavior immediately. Yeah, last year's budget, the city council did approve us to actually add some red, red light running cameras at a couple of intersections. We're still working through which ones we would like to to try those out at a pilot project. But yes, we're very interested in testing this in a couple of places and the council supported that. And we'd like to see how that works and may want to do that in more places. The only issue there is it does, it's a, it's a costly, we have to actually uh, secure a vendor for those red light cameras and then the, the tickets that come with it. So it is a costly venture to, to do that. So we're gonna test it out, see how they work. If you, uh, I would love to have some of those right off of Capital <laughs> Expressway, McLaughlin. I, I've seen people literally five, even ten seconds after the light turned red, and they're right. still running it. Well, thank you, uh, staff, for for not shying away from the, some of these tough questions um, and briefing uh, briefing us on these issues ahead. And um, thank you for those thoughtful and thorough design um, and to save lives in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Councilmember. Thanks, John. We're on to Councilmember Foley. Thank you. It's okay, John. I don't have a question for you. I just have a comment <laughs> as he looks back at me. It, it, funding this, this is one of those priority safety corridors within Vision Zero, and it is important that we fund it and that we improve it. We have had recent <laughs> fatalities there. Councilmember Esparza would be very thrilled that we're doing some work over there and improving that in a in a better way it's really important that we do everything we can to keep to make our streets safer than they are and i'm happy to support the motion and move forward on this thank you thanks I'll second i thought we had a motion from councilor condellas yeah yeah motion and a second thank you uh councilor ortiz i just wanted to um uh, emphasize council member dewan's uh comments in regards to Street lighting, I know that's gonna be a big priority for um, my office when we start advocating for the budget, especially on uh, business corridors. We get a lot of traffic issues and you know, unfortunately individuals who commit crimes feel emboldened when our streets are not lit up. So a lot of people think, you know, uh, first responders, well it's first responders and, and other solutions and I think street lighting is uh, a great way to curb crime and uh, casualty of life, thank you. Thank you. Agreed. Okay. Let's vote on item 3.4. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kame? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Also, we didn't hear the second, so we don't know who made it. That was the Thank vice you. mayor. Thank you. Okay. 3.4 passes. We're on to item 6.1. Procurement Authority for San Jose Community Energy. Lori, we have a presentation, is that right? We do, a very short one. Great. 
So good afternoon, Mayor and Council. I'm Lori Mitchell, I'm the Director of Community Energy, and today I'm actually joined by Zach Strike, who is our Assistant Director. Jean Zoulet couldn't be with us today. So this item is to increase our authority to purchase power. You can see in the table here our existing authority, um, what we're recommending today, and then our net expected costs over the next two calendar years. So just as a reminder, our Risk Oversight Committee has approved our recommendation of procuring power up to 125% of our expected load for both calendar years 23 and 2024. The reason we're recommending this is that power prices have been volatile in recent months and higher than historical averages, and we do expect this trend to continue. So you'll see this on the next slide, but we did see prices increase in September due to the heat wave, and then again into December and um, well into January, we saw very increased pricing, in part due to the colder temperatures, but also due to some natural gas market supply limitations. So just as a reminder, procuring ahead does significantly reduce our exposure to these short-term market disruptions, so we always recommend the majority of our procurement is procured in the forward markets and not in the real-time and day-ahead markets. Um, it's important to note that although we are recommending increases in our authority to buy power, we do not expect to raise rates at this time. Our revenues have also been higher in both December and Jan January related to the increase in electricity usage. Um, and these prices may impact uh, our reserve targets, but right now we think we're still on track for meeting that 180 days in operating expenses by the end of the calendar year. So this graph shows you some of the volatility that we're seeing in power markets. So that September increase in prices was related to the heat wave. And then in December, we saw very large increases, as I explained, due to the, both the colder temperatures and to supply disruptions, mostly in natural gas markets um, in December and into January. They are now settling back to historical averages. So this chart uh, you know, explains what we're recommending today. That is the light blue bar. The dark blue bars is what council has previously approved us to buy. And then the yellow is what we have contracted in forward contracts. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Great, thanks, Lori. Let's go to the public first. I have no hands. Okay, coming back to council. Give my colleagues a moment. Do you have any questions? Move approval. Second. Okay, we'll give that to Foley with the motion and Cohen with the second. Still no hands. Okay, let's vote. Jimenez? Torres? Yes. Cohen? Yes, for Jimenez. Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kamei? Aye. Mayhem? Aye. Thank you. Great, that passes. We're on to 6.2. Thank you, Lori and Zach. Uh, this is 6.2, report on bids and, con and award of contract for South Bay water recycler recycling, metering, and pressure monitoring improvements. That's a mouthful. Okay. Any staff report? No. We will go to public comment. No hands. No hands. Okay. Back to council. I'll move approval. Second. Okay. It's time we have Cohen with the motion, Foley with the second. Any questions, comments? I'll go ahead and ask one quick question if we have anyone in the, in the chamber who can answer. Um, my notes say that this investment will help us improve the reliability of the system, and I was hoping you could just tell us a little more about the value of this $2.67 million investment. Great question. Thank you, Mayor. My name is Jeff Provenzano. I'm a Deputy Director in the Water Resources Division, um, Deputy Director for South Bay Water Recycling. Um, it's a good project for us. Um, what Really what we're doing is putting the instruments in to look at real-time data in the water system and a bunch of features we'll get out of that, reporting, regulatory compliance, but uh, one of the key features are uh, flow and pressure monitoring. Um, as the system's grown over time, 
It, it, it experiences some stresses in different places. And right now, we really don't have eyes out in there to kind of see how it's behaving, how it's operating. And so this is phase one. We'll come back in a year or so with another phase. It's really to kind of gather that data and move forward with um, preventive maintenance strategies that preserve the useful life um, and just a range of benefits. So really, it's a data collection program to make better decisions going forward. Thanks, Chef. Appreciate that. And just to put it in layman's terms, if, if there's a leak, does this help us identify that there's a leak in the system? It will help us to uh, more quickly respond. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Appreciate that. Okay. Looks like I've inspired a couple of colleagues. Jeff, don't go too far. Councilmember Dewan. Do any of the company who made bids have a history of bidding low and then increase their cost after they got awarded with the contract? Um, not that we know of with these companies, uh, but that sometimes we see that. Um, and really that comes back to us on the project management side to ensure that uh, the project is delivered um, per plans and specs. Thank you, that's all I have. Thanks, Councilmember. Councilmember Batra. So this says that uh, it is for metering. That means the thing is already in place and you're doing some improvements, or this is first time implementation of something? Uh, this would be um, new, new metering stations at new locations, different locations throughout the distribution system. So is it the supply of water, recycled water, or is it, uh, say a little more about it, is it the collection place you're monitoring, or? It, um, it is uh, on the supply side of recycled water, not the production, but the, the movement of that water from, it's produced at the regional wastewater facility, and as it moves out uh, to the three cities of San Jose, Santa Clara, and Malpitas, um, it is, uh, stations uh, and devices that are put in to track the movement of that water as it moves uh, throughout the three cities. Okay, all right, thank you. Great, thanks council member, thanks again Jeff, appreciate it. Okay, I think we're ready to vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? <clears throat> yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Aye. Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kamei? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Great, thank you. 6.2 passes, we're on to item 8.1. Overruling objections to the 2023-2024 weed abatement commencement report. And do we have a staff report? We do, mm -hmm. excellent. All right, we already have questions coming in. All right, Rachel, whenever you're ready. Thank you. <clears throat> um, good afternoon, City Council. I'm Rachel Roberts, Deputy Director of Code Enforcement. I'm here today to present on the overruling objections to the 2023-2024 Weed Abatement Commencement Report and directing the removal of weeds or refuse. Um, along with me is the Weed Abatement Program Manager um, from the County of Santa Clara and that Mo Cymru, and he's here to have, help answer any questions you may have. So we just wanted to provide a um, brief overview of the program. I know this is um, always a good topic to provide a refresher as well as to help inform um, our new council members. So we'll touch briefly on the program partnership, then the annual process, property owner notification and information, the abatement um, example that we have to show you, and staff recommendation. <clears throat> so this partnership actually began in 1995. Um, Santa Clara County and the city entered into an agreement for the county to administer the weed abatement program on behalf of the city. And the purpose of this program is to protect the property and surrounding areas and the public from fire by ensuring that the minimum fire safety standards are met on the identified parcels. The county administers the program in San Jose as well as um, in other jurisdictions throughout the county. And we currently have 308 vacant um, parcels for the purposes of this program. Vacant means these parcels are not developed. Um, the Code Enforcement Division oversees the program and we facilitate the compliance with the regulatory requirements under, under the Municipal Code, and that falls under Title IX, Chapter 9.12, um, including the public hearing um, we're having today as well as the Council resolutions. 
And overall, the goal is voluntary compliance. We are always striving for the property owners to um, bring their own properties into compliance, and it is a cost recovery program. So each year, um, we go through the same annual process, um, and for the most part, um, we're hitting each of these steps in each of these months. Um, so in November, the county uh, produced the hazardous vegetation commencement report um, and provided that to the city. Um, and then in December of this past year, so that should say December 13th, 2022, apologize, um, we held the public hearing um, here at City Council to accept the report and declare that the weeds are a public nuisance. And so following that hearing um, and the resolution from Council, the county sent um, the property owners of the properties in the list a letter um, indicating their responsibility to abate the weeds. So along this process um, brings us to today. Um, today we are hearing, um, oh, holding a hearing, excuse me, um, to provide the opportunity for any property owners on the list to um, contest the inclusion of their property in the program um, and that, or otherwise the requirement to abate the weeds um, or any other combustible material prior to the March 1st deadline. Um, March 1st is tomorrow. <laughs> so uh, once, once we uh, hit tomorrow, then the county will start their compliance inspections of each of the parcels within the program. And should we find that a property owner has not um, proactively remove the vegetation or any other combustible materials as identified then they will move forward with abating those weeds um, in June the, we do uh, gather all this information up as far as which proper, properties received those services and um, that information will be uh, put together by the county and submitted to code enforcement um, and then in July we hold another public hearing it's actually before the appeals hearing board um, and it's for the county to um, add any fees that went unpaid um, for either the, the basic program fee or the abatement work that occurred as a special assessment on the tax bill. And so that's another opportunity that the property owners have to contest the um, assessment of those fees against their property. So along the way, um, the county does an excellent job of notifying and informing um, any property owner who is on, in the program. Um, they send out all the public hearing notices um, for each hearing that's held in, throughout the process. They also provide, um, following the December meeting, um, a notice to destroy, which basically indicates uh, that council has determined the weeds to be a nuisance and that it is their responsibility to abate. The owners are also provided a return reply form where they have three options. Um, it's a form that they can fill out and send back to the county and they can indicate that they're no longer the owner of the parcel and therefore not responsible. They may indicate that they intend to perform the abatement themselves or they may indicate at that time that they'd like the county to do it on their behalf. Uh, the county also provides weed abatement brochures that include um, the process as well as the minimum fire safety standards they're expected to maintain their properties in accordance with. Um, and then they also provide the, the program schedule, which I just went over, as well as the basic fees of the program and the price list for any abatement work. So this is a p very common scenario. Um, we got the parcel on the left um, prior to abatement and, and post abatement on the right. And so our recommendation today is that you adopt a resolution to overrule any and all objections to the 23-24 weed abatement commencement report and direct the county consumer and environmental protection agency to abate the seasonal and or recurrent public nuisances on those properties identified in the weed abatement commencement report pursuant to chapter 9.12 of title 9 of the San Jose Municipal Code and the weed abatement agreement between the city and the county. And that concludes our report. Great, thank you both. Okay, let's go to public comment. Heather, Doug, and Joe. Um, first person to the, uh, if you are still here. So that's Heather, Doug, and Joe. Um, first person to the microphone, go ahead and go to the microphone and say your name. The other two people, um, you can just line up over here next to the security um, person and you'll get your turn after the first people speaker. Hello, my name is Joe Faro. I'm a property owner in San Jose. 
I was uh, here with the city uh, a few year, uh, I'd say a few years back, where I was given the $200 fine for not being in compliance with a deadline that I was not notified of. So being that I was not notified, we made the argument and they seemed that it was unjust. Now again today, I'm getting a notice telling me that I have to pay $92 for an inspection. If I'm not in compliance, I'm going to get $519 processing late fee. I was given this letter. It was post the 17th of this month. Uh, I probably got it on the 20th. So March 1st is the deadline. You gave me eight days to get my property ready? Come on. I, I get paid every two weeks. I need at least a little time to come up with the money. I tried to hire somebody for the weekend, this weekend, so I would be in compliance, but nobody wanted to do the work in the rain because we have a storm. So there's an additional $891 of the contractor's charges plus the county administration fee. That's a total of $1,500. What are you guys, what are you trying to do to us? I mean, I pay property taxes, and now you want to hit me with $1,500 if I'm not in compliance? And that's every six months, two times a year? If I'm going to have an inspection and then pay $92, I don't want the city inspector to drive by and look out his car window and say, oh, yeah, he's got weeds. I want to have a set date that I meet the inspector, I'm there when the inspection's done, and it's written off. Not too much to ask for. I want my money's worth of I'm going to pay $92. Plus, Thank you. Thank you. Your time is up. Just, oh, my. Yes. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Heather McAllister. It's my first time speaking here. I'm a little nervous. Uh, like you, I am a public servant. I'm a substitute teacher for the Moreland District in West San Jose. I also am the director of the Senior Nutrition Program for the county at Santa Clara Senior Center. I had to take the afternoon off uh, to be here. Uh, last summer, I purchased a vacant property. It's my first time doing this. My goal is to build a house there. I, uh, the taxes were very high. I paid the property tax and an additional $4,000 plus in fire abatement tax. I received the notice that was mentioned last fall and I checked yes, I would like to take care of this myself. Uh, I also emailed the code enforcement person, Joseph Hatfield, and he referred me to a list of county providers. Like the previous gentleman, nobody wanted to work on a lot that was my size or my location. It's up on the hill in Alum Rock Park. It's, the view is insanely gorgeous. My point is that I am earning less than I did as a high school student. I love what I do and I wouldn't trade it, but it makes it a financial burden. The fees listed here are really hard for me to make. $92 for the assessment processing 519 891 for the administrative fee excuse me and then additionally a lot of hourly rates for the loader the dump truck etc um, i would like to have an extension that's what i was trying to say this was mailed on the 17th and i received it also about 8 days ago nobody wants to work on my lot and it has been raining torrentially so much that Alum Rock Park, which I'm around the corner from, has been closed. I want to be in compliance, but it seems that there's no way to do so. Can, I'm asking to extend the deadline. Thank you so much. Thank you. There are no hands online. Back to council. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe I'll start quickly and then I see a number of my colleagues have hands up. Just um, Rachel, in terms of timing, is it standard that someone would only have a week or two to comply? It sounds like from at least the two folks we heard, people were receiving things in the mail just about 10 days ago. Is that, does that sound right? Well, they were actually noticed twice. Uh, my name is Mo Cymru. I am the weed abatement manager for Santa Clara County. 
the original date of hearing uh, had been set for the, for the seventh. We had noticed and an affidavit, an affidavit of mailing was sent to the city. Then we were informed later that the rules committee changed the meeting to today and we re-noticed immediately upon confirmation of the notice change. That's why it was short notice on this. Also, I'd like to note that March 1st is annually when the inspections begin in the city of San Jose, but due to the wet weather, we'll be pushing that back at least until the 15th. Okay, and can you just clarify when the original notice went out? It went out in uh, mid-December. Uh, I believe it was on the 14th. Okay, so over, safe to say over two months ago. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to clarify that. And the re-noticing was due to us on our end moving the meeting out a couple of weeks. That is correct. Okay, just wanted to clarify that. But go ahead, Rachel. Uh, thank you. I was just going to add that following that December 13th meeting, as Mo said, um, the majority of the correspondence that from the program goes out immediately following that, that action by council in December. Okay. And then... On the issue of an extension, just so the council understands what its options are here, what, can you just help us understand what we, what, what we can do if we wanted to take any action today? We can overrule the objections. We can sustain them. I heard mention of an extension. Is that within our power to do? That's absolutely within your power. Again, we are moving all inspections back at least two weeks. And we also will happily work with any of the property owners regarding individual extensions for someone who's attempting to get uh, find a contractor or some other way need help to get the work done in a timely manner. Thank you for that. Is the contact information on the notice where they should reach out if they want to work with you individually for an extension? How would they? There, there is contact information on the original noticing. I don't believe it was on the, the final notice. For the two people that are here today, I do have business cards for them to contact me directly. Right. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. So those business cards are up here for folks who want to individually request an extension. Okay, and staff's going to help make sure we hand those out. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that. I'll turn to my colleagues now. We'll go to Councilmember Foley. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mayor, for asking a couple of the questions I had. But I have sort of a general question. How is this list generated? Every property on the list has been identified by my department at least once in the last three years to be non-compliant with the minimum fire safe standards during the fire season. Uh, we, can, we do that through several means. Uh, we can get contacted by code enforcement, uh, property owners call about neighbors, uh, but also the most likely cause is as we're going around looking at vacant lots that we have on the list already, we see another lot that's not compliant. We take a photograph. We then go back, verify that it's in the, that it's within the jurisdiction, uh, and not owned by a public entity. And then we send a notice to the property owner, informing them that next year we're going to place you on the program. Uh, our policy is that any property placed in the program will remain on the program for until it demonstrates three consecutive years of voluntary compliance, or is developed. Okay, so is this list just uh, of vacant property or what I would call bare lot, bare land? These are not uh, houses that have tall weeds in front of them. These, these are vacant properties that you refer to as unimproved, but there's no dwelling there. All lots that we address in San Jose are vacant lots, no structures. Okay. Uh, and then the, the bill that they receive is included in their property taxes? Is that what yes, I understood, Yes, it, it's included as a special assessment in the property taxes after it goes to the second public hearing and is approved, the property owners have an opportunity to contest. Uh, if you'd like, I can explain the fees real quick so there's not the confusion I think that might have been created uh, here. Sure, that would be helpful. Uh, because we are a cost recovery program, 
we have to recover what it costs us to do the jobs that we do. So every property that's inspected is charged $92. That covers our cost to do the inspections. If the properties are compliant with the minimum fire safe standards, that is the only fee they will be assessed. If the property is not compliant, we will issue a work order. We will send a courtesy notice to the property owner giving them 15 days to resolve it, or we will send a contractor out to resolve. When we do that, that's the $526 charge because that's the amount of time and effort that's involved in what we have to do. And then if, if we have to abate the property, if we actually have to have a contractor go in and cut the grass, we will provide proof that it needed to be done when they got there, that it was done before they left, and then they're charged the cost of that abatement plus the, uh, the 800, I forgot the exact figure, 895, I believe something, something of that nature. So, so the $92 is the initial notice. We've seen your property. It's got weeds. You need to abate. That's $92. Yes. The $895, i am not clear what that's it, for. It's $891. <laughs> that's what, if, if I have to have a contractor actually go out and perform the abatement, okay. then they're going to pay for the abatement, which is listed by hourly rate or by square footage. Right. And the, that is all paid directly to the contractor. I mean, it's paid through us directly to the contractor. Then the county's services that are involved in that process, we charge uh, $891 for what we have to do because we're going through that process. Okay, so if the property owner does the abatement themselves, what's their bottom line cost? $92. $92 it's yeah. just the $92. Just $92. Okay. So the rest is if you have to send a contractor out and then the contractor does the work, contractor bills, and or they, you have a or fee. Or they fail to comply. Understand, yeah, understand. Okay, so it's really, we're talking $92 if, if the two individuals present are able to get someone out to their property. And I understand there might be difficulty with that given the weather and, and other things. And again, they can contact my office and we'll make arrangements with them. We'll work with them to allow them that opportunity. So you're flexible on imposing the penalty because really you just want it abated. Again, our, our, our key goal is voluntary compliance. So if someone is contacting my office, letting me know that I'm attempting to make to do that, then I'm going to work with them to give them an opportunity to do it uh, within a reasonable time frame. Okay. And do we provide the property owners with the list of contractors who might do this work? Uh, we have that on our website, and we've provided it to the city for... Uh, we don't recommend anybody, but we do have a list of people who claim to do this kind of work in the county, and it's, it's a relatively uh, long list. Okay. Very good. Uh, thank you very much. With that, I will move uh, approval. Second. Okay, moved and seconded. We'll go to Council Member Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you, staff, for thoroughly coordinating to ensure this work is completed. Um, in District 5, we suffer uh, from what I would call absentee landlords, where we have blight filled properties that, are, uh, that eventually impact our entire neighborhoods, our residents, invite crime uh, and other unwanted. Uh, um, activities so I, I definitely see this as a priority for for myself and I believe the the entire city because I don't think these vacant uh, um, uh, properties are just a, a district five issue it's a city it's a citywide issue you know and our, and our residents are forced to bear the brunt of, of um, uninvolved uh, property owners and, and I look forward to seeing many of these blighted properties be addressed um, as well as the overall conditions that they invite into our neighborhoods. And I do appreciate for the good actors, for the good property owners who want to be in compliance, who reach out, um, who say, hey, give me some extra time. I do appreciate you being flexible. You know, there are good and bad property owners, uh, uh, and sometimes people get in a hole, and we should always give individuals second chances. So just wanted to thank you for your work. Thanks, Council Member. Council Member Batra. <clears throat> you explained how and what the cost are once a person or property is on the program. But what's the cost and the process for getting a property on the program? Because must, you said it must be in not compliance in the last three years 
and how did they get first time on there? What effort did you make to get them on there? There's uh, a couple of different ways that a property can get onto our abatement list. One is that it is referred to as someone, uh, our website offers an opportunity for any, anyone to leave an anonymous uh, complaint about a property. Uh, we do work with code enforcement. They may see something they want us to address. Or the most likely cause, because we do cover so much of the, the area, is that as my inspectors are out looking at property A, they notice property B during the fire season, and they go ahead, take pictures, and, and do the ad process. Uh, those people aren't charged anything because they haven't yet been through this process. This is a requirement of the law. So when they go through this process, assuming you approve the list, then charges would apply only after all those services are provided. So the first time getting on doesn't cost them anything on the program, and they get ample notices to be able to be in compliant, right? Correct. Okay. Once they're in the program, do, does their property address appear on any website? We have, uh, not currently, Currently, only the unincorporated list is up on my website. It is a discussion, and we would verify with the city prior to putting it up, but we have suggested putting, we do 12 jurisdictions, putting all the jurisdictions lists available on the website, uh, but I won't do that without first getting the approval from uh, the Code Enforcement Department, my contacts here with the city. Uh, but we do have the unincorporated list on, the, on our website right now. Okay, but currently the city of San Jose residents are not on that list, so there's no public information about they're, they're it. They're not available on the website, no. Okay, all right, thank you. Thanks, Councilor. Councilor Cohn? Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for the thorough report. I mean, this is the third year I think I've seen this item and first time I understood it, so <laughs> I, I appreciate it. Um, so it was well, well presented today. Um, and I, that's partly because I think in the past we haven't had any objections that we've had brought forward, so we haven't had this discussion. So, But I'm glad that we, we have it. Um, this is an important service. Um, there, is a home, there is a property two doors down from me that has been vacant for 30 years, but fortunately the property owner comes every year and and mows down the property and keeps it keeps it safe we you know in in the east part of the city up in the foothills of below the foothills or in the foothills by allen rock park and by district five district four district eight there's severe fire danger that we're concerned about and we don't want properties overgrowing so it is important that um property owners maintain those property and keep it the, the properties around them safe so i do appreciate that and the the work that you're doing and and hope that you know, property owners will, will be able to figure out how to comply going forward. Thanks. Well said. My only amendment would be District 10 also faces severe fire risk. <laughs> but uh, yeah, totally agree. This is the, the best I have understood the issue to date as well. Councilmember Dawn. I'll pass. Thank you. Okay, great. I think we're ready to vote. Jimenez. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Cond I'm so sorry, I haven't said your last name yet. Um, <laughs> Condellas? Condellas, thank you. Condellas? <laughs> Aye. Thanks. Um, Foley? Aye. Batra? Aye. Kume? Aye. Mahan? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. So 8.1 passes. We are on to item 8.2. From the city initiatives roadmap, this has to do with our expansion of emergency interim housing and specifically the receipt of home key program round two funds for the site at Branham and Monterey. And Jennifer, do we have someone introducing the item? Do you want to no. say a few words now? Um, okay. I think we're just. Uh, Are we we're good? Okay. Yeah, we're here for questions. Okay. We'll uh, circle back for questions. Let's go to public comment. Okay. We have one in person speaker, Sean Paul. Well then, um, good afternoon, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I was hoping to get my notebook at least. But um, yeah, uh, I basically was just gonna talk about how a lot of um, the funding is spent on, uh, uh, like um, Council Member uh, 
Don said a, a lot of it should uh, be times. specific to the item, the Branham oh. and Monterey site, and the receipt of home key funds. Uh, yes, yes. Basically, the the reason why I was talking about the the funds was since they are being repurposed. I wanted to speak on the potential for also having a program to where people can prove their um, uh, commitment to uh, assisting themselves in improving uh, their overall literacy and also improving themselves economically through their education, and that could help to prove that they are more um, equitable candidates to be receiving these funds. So I just wanted to uh, bring that to your attention since if people were able to sort of, in a way, prove their commitment to utilizing those funds properly, that could assist, assist with saving some of those resources uh, since uh, it would basically allow people to Man, I wish I had my notebook. Um, since it would assist people in being able to show their commitment to the process and also showing that it would help to get more funds too since a lot of these are performance-based and it could help to retrieve more funds for the city and other projects like it since based off of the way that they, um, they improve themselves, it can also help to improve the program by improving the overall funding by showing... Um, uh, OKR metrics based on their improvement and whatnot. So I, I just wanted to bring that to your attention since that could be a possibility to help prevent people from continuing to be taken out of the, um, uh, to continue being homeless and whatnot. Uh, like Councilmember Ben Dunn was saying with one out of every three people being accepted ends up uh, leading to three people being um, homeless still. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Caller 7911 followed by Blair. Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? We can barely hear you. Okay, can you hear me better now? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. Paul, well, um, I just wanted to comment on the, uh, the last um, subject and this one tied together, um, that there is uh, obviously a lot of need for the I don't see a contractor needed to pull weeds. Um, this is something that I, I think would be therapeutic and also useful um, as a service in, in some of this uh, yard work and cleanup things. Ma'am, um, has it ever been considered? Has it ever been considered? You know, to to put people in uh, situations to help put in order to receive housing. The green program for beautify San Jose, uh, programs of that considered in trade for housing. Ma'am, are you still speaking? Because we're not hearing anything. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Now I can. Yeah. Okay. Let me let me do my speaker. Is that better? Yes. You have 30 seconds. Okay, thanks for taking my call. Okay. Yes. Um, so I was I was just commenting about, you know, uh, landscaping and these kind of things like weed abatement, um, pulling weeds is, is, is something I, I think any any uh, able body can do. I think a contractor is needed for these kind of things. And is there any kind of program or thought to trading community service uh, for Home Key, um, being able to, to work um, for the uh, county or the city in order to get housing. Um, is there any kind of programs like that, like the Beautify San Jose with the green bag program in order to get showers or storage or things like that? Because these things are really helpful. Um, you know, a lot of nonprofits bring the mobile showers around and, and they they make a big difference. But, you know, people should have to work for, for these things, I think, and outdoor you know, uh, okay, ma'am, I'm gonna weed abatement sounds great. Okay, sorry about that. I gave you a little extra time because you had problems with your audio, but I'm gonna move on to the next speaker. Um, Blair, hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks for this item. Thank you to Tony for allowing a little extra time for that uh, previous caller to be able to explain her uh, idea. Thank you. Um, I wanted to offer, I guess something of my usual and that uh, it's important and it's helpful and it's meaningful as the home key program has been and what it can be doing for ourselves 
uh, to kind of comment on uh, the first public comment, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the ways that uh, with so much funding that can be available from the state and federal level in our future, you know, mainly the state level, um, I really hope that we can learn as a city to talk about exactly what programs we are actually moving forward with, uh, you know, established programs, traditional programs of housing. Um, issues like uh, following, uh, you know, homeless, uh, a homeless client or situation from its beginning to its end. We haven't been able to do that in the past, and I think we can now. And it's those sorts of practices that I think really lends to what the first public commenter was trying to say, that once we get people established in Home Key and other programs, how do we then offer the follow-up wraparound services? And, and how do we uh, try to talk to the new administration? How do we offer the metrics to show that and make that clear what we were working on in 2018 and how we've taken really good steps since, say, 2018 to where we are now in improving upon our housing issues and not just going around in a big circle, well, we're doing this now, we're doing this now, doing this now. Why not explain directly each housing thing we're doing better since 2018 and show us the good examples that uh, this Home Key program and a lot of other state funding help can do at this time for our more traditional housing uh, practices and needs. Thanks a lot. Back to the council. Okay, great. Thank you. Just. Checking for hands, not Move seeing. approval. Great, thank you. Second. Second from Council Member Torres. You want to give it to Jimenez? Okay. It, uh, it's okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so let we vote. Jimenez? Yes. Torres? Yes. Cohen? Aye. Ortiz? Aye. Davis? Yes. Doan? Aye. Candelas? Foley? Aye. Batra? Can I make one comment before I say it? Uh, we're, we're voting now, sorry. Let's vote. Okay, aye. Kame? Aye. Mayhem. Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that gets us to the point of taking a recess. We will begin the evening session to consider land use items at 6 p.m. So I'll see you all. Are we gonna take open forum? For the day meeting? We will take open forum. Okay, Sean Paul, followed by Blair. All right. Good afternoon, uh, Honorable Mayor and City Council. I just got done following up with John Restro about uh, strategic partnerships that could alleviate some of the concerns of the city, specifically revolving around employment issues and also about Vision Zero, since that still uh, seems to be a high uh, strategic priority for the city. And likewise, with the 311 app, a lot of the problems that the city is facing is staffing needs, and they, you, you really do need to fill those positions or at least get started. And um, one of the great resources that I ended up finding to help alleviate some of those concerns um, is um, this one nonprofit called Develop for Your Good. And they can help you a lot in various ways because of the fact that they have um, the unique proposition of partnering with computer science students from uh, different universities and they haven't not yet partnered with some of the local universities or community colleges in our area. And there's the potential for them to expand upon that. And that can also help to expand upon a lot of the youth homeless, youth homeless problems that we're facing. And that could also help to alleviate a lot of the budget concerns as well, since they also usually, I think you pay around like $1,000 per every 800 development hours. And that comes out to around like $1.25 per hour for developers, which is an extremely good deal as I'm sure some of you might know if you uh, work in tech. And um, yeah, I'll be following up with the director on the 6th. They'll be taking applications until the 10th. And I uh, offered my assistance to help uh, John with uh, making his application. And I believe that it will also be of good assistance to the 311 app to also uh, take advantage of that as well, since it can alleviate a lot of the budget concerns. 
it can help with the staffing issues and it can fall within the lines of the budget parameters that you're facing for this program. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention so that could help to branch off to a lot of other strategic partnerships with a lot of the things that it would bring uh, to the community through the opportunities that will help to give to our youth and everyone else. So thank you. Blair, followed by Jill. Hi, uh, Blair Beekman here. I missed the study session uh, meeting this morning at 11. I'll review it and hopefully have a few comments uh, later in the week. And just overall, thanks for having the meeting. Uh, I, you know, when I, I was trying to get to the agenda today, a habit that's been going on here at City Council on your public website since, uh, you know, at least the fall of last year is that you keep repeating uh, your agenda items on the calendar. On, the, on your public website calendar. It makes for a really confusing process. I don't know exactly you know, what's going on. If there's a, a computer blip or something, uh, I, to mention it openly here can hopefully get you guys on course to correct it. Because I think it uh, really inhibits uh, clarity and it keeps people away from the process and it, it, it makes it confusing. And we need to do everything in our power to make the process as unconfusing as possible. That's an important goal. So good luck on how to work on that. It's been an issue that's been going on since at least uh, maybe last summer. I hope you can fix it. Um, with my remaining time, I wanted to comment on, uh, there was a public, uh, there was a uh, TED meeting yesterday that talked about uh, you know priorities, goals for the next year and stuff. Uh, the future of electronic billboards was mentioned and I, I got a little bit tough. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, but uh, I'm not happy with the electronic billboard issue. And I hope that, uh, you know, with your tech issues, you're really uh, talking with city government staff at Civic Innovation, uh, you know, and, and, and wanting to put off your own tech decisions maybe until the fall when you get a real sense of what Civic Innovation, uh, they've been really working hard. Uh, Mayor Licardo, previous Mayor Licardo, worked really hard to, to create a, a group that is committed to want to learn how to really talk with the community more about the future of tech. They really want to move forward in those good terms. And I think you have to really study those good things and learn those good things and, and learn to speak the language of, of talking directly about the subject matter. Thank you. Jill. Hi, thank you. This is Jill Borders, from, a resident from District 10. I actually have a quick question. Um, that I know you can't answer, but you can cut me off if that's the case. I don't know we were going to do land use items when we come back at six, but did we already do land use consent items? I was unsure if we had done that. We did not. Okay, so then I can address those items um, at six. Um, yes. Thank you so much. That's it. Call our 7911. Uh, thank you for taking my call again for this open forum. I um, yes. just wanted to thank uh, Blair for his nice comment. And when we, um, it, it, it is not easy to navigate through this process. I'm doing the best I can. Sorry for my connection. I just wanted to say that um, some of these tech stuff, like the electronic billboard, some of the things going on, uh, there's not a scientific research on the effects that these frequencies that are being put off by these LED lights, by these electronic um, devices, or having on the animals and on the nature and on people, um, actually. And two, I, I wanted to say that, um, you know, I, I think that there's some memorandums that were given with the 311 app for people calling on vehicles needing to be towed for COVID and uh, um, abating vehicles, having them being able uh, to have a shorter time to go to a dismantler temporarily for COVID. I spoke to the uh, sergeant in charge of towing. Um, he said that there were some provisions made uh, for COVID. Um, have they been re-looked at to go back to the original rules for towing um, and for auction sales and getting rid of vehicles um, so quickly, like three, five day turnaround and people using 311 to call on vehicles and having them um, disappear uh, for all kinds of different reasons. Um, I think that that needs to be looked at, that memo. Um, have, not having two license plates is a reason to car. Well, it's very easy to have two license plates removed. 
you know, brand new cars. So thank you for uh, taking my comments. Back to council. Great, thank you. We'll see everybody at 6 p.m.